Hey, David, let's test this out. If if uh, I'm talking, it's not switching to me. I'm, I'm just trying to the smallest thumbnail on my screen. Didn't switch to me. That's weird. Normally, it switches to whoever's speaking. I wanted to see if it switched to you if you raise, raise your hand. Um, my, my name shows you speaking right now. I raise. I just raised my hand. And okay, it just went to Dave's. Yeah. Oh, but I'm speaking too, so that may maybe let me. But you popped up before you spoke, so I think I oh, think we're good. Okay. So feeling good about that. Good. So I'll start then. Yeah, we're all good. Yep. Yeah. So um, my name is Dave Donaldson. Uh, along with David Atkin, uh, we've been asked to convene a. a, a PhD sort of level Zoom course via on the behalf of Brad and IGC about the topic of firms and development. Uh, this is lecture number four. Uh, previous lectures are online on the IGC website, uh, recordings and slides and reading lists. And uh, I encourage you to check those out if you haven't already. Uh, but today we're delighted to have Pete Kleenow. He's a, a professor of economics at Stanford University. He's a giant in this field and he's very generously uh, donated his time today to, to contribute to the series. Uh, he's going to be lecturing on the topic of misallocation, uh, which touches on themes we've already covered. In, in the first lecture, we um, we talked about how a, at a broad level, you can think about um, individual firms becoming more productive, uh, learning new techniques, uh, learning new technologies, getting access to those things. And that's what the last couple of lectures have been about. Um, Today, we're pivoting in the course more towards the question of misallocation, that is to say, sort of firms getting access to inputs. Uh, uh, and since asking about the allocation of inputs to firms uh, relative, to the, relative to other uses like other firms, uh, and that's the broad theme that Pete's going to sort of uh, usher us into starting today. So with all that said, Pete, uh, it's over to you. And, and sorry, just to remind you on protocol, everybody. Um, so panelists, uh, that is a randomly chosen people who've been invited to be panelists. You're welcome to raise your hand uh, at any time uh, to the extent Pete um, uh, feels <laughs> the time allows, he'll he'll call on you to, um, to speak. You'll be able to unmute yourself and ask your question out loud. Everybody else, um, feel free to write your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, to the extent the time that time allows, we'll read out those questions for Pete to answer as well. Anyway, take it away, Pete. Thanks. Okay. Thanks very much for the introduction, Dave. And thanks for you and David for inviting me to participate. This is um, a great opportunity. Um, okay. So I want to talk about misallocation. And specifically, um, my outline is, I'm going to start with a, a definition and a, and a simple model. And then I'm going to give examples of things that I think are and are not sources of misallocation. Then I'm going to talk about five facts um, that I think have already been documented in the literature, and then three promising areas for future research that I think people are working on right now, and there's still plenty of room for more progress. Um, and then at the end, you know, I have some stuff in the slides about data sets in case people are curious, so I probably will just skip over that. Um, and then if there's time, I'll, I'll talk about some select papers in the literature that I haven't talked about already that I particularly like and think are particularly insightful. Okay, so let me dive in. So what? how would I define misallocation? This is my own personal definition. I don't know if there's an accepted definition. So I would describe it as um, a misallocation of inputs of some form. That could be people across occupations. It could be capital across um, firms or you know labor across plants within a firm. There's any, any number of um, versions of that. But the, one of the reasons I wrote this definition down was to try to clarify that it wouldn't be something like if you could repeal the laws of gravity and you could reallocate goods across space more easily, that that would be the fact that we don't do that wouldn't be a source of misallocation. We're constrained optimal, made perhaps in the allocation of goods across space, given the physical constraints we have. I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more on that. But so I, I go even farther to say, the planner must know something and see something so that they could tax and subsidize some activities um, to reallocate inputs in a way that would be a Pareto improvement. I guess I'd call this a potential Pareto improvement. Um, so one way to say this is the efficiency of resource allocation. That's what all of economics is about. And that's that's true. Um, although there's all, it's also about maximizing social welfare at least in, in my view. So it, misallocation is not so much about that. That's like a separate question. Although I'll touch on that in terms of what I think are promising areas for future research. Okay, so now I'll move on to the simple model. Um, 
So picture CES aggregation of different goods I. So YI is production of these different goods. And there's a, a fixed measure M of those or fixed number M of those. And sigma is this elasticity of substitution. And then you can define an ideal price index for this economy that's a generalized mean of, of the individual prices. And picture the production of the individual goods is just linear in labor, just for simplicity. But you could add lots of different things to that capital intermediates, which, which, are, which are interesting. But for the simple, just to get fixed ideas, just imagine linear production. And imagine, here's the mysterious part. Um, imagine there's some firm specific or good specific, I. So these could be firms that, that produce these, these goods. Um, so it could be firm specific uh, revenue tax rate that, that varies across firms. The Y is for signifying it's a tax on, on output. Um, and then picture the firm's monopolistic competitive, meaning it takes input prices for its L is given, takes the, the, the price index capital P is given, and even the aggregate production, which will affect its residual demand, takes all those as given. There's a fixed resource constraint. And just for simplicity, not only is there a fixed L, but there's a fixed um, number of firms. Okay, so in this economy, firms are, are all going to charge the same markup if it, if the the tows which i'm now calling one over one minus the revenue tax so it's like a grossed up version of this tax so a higher revenue tax means a higher tau they'd actually charge higher prices if they face higher tau which makes sense um so it's as if they had higher markups but in this economy with cs demand and monopolistic competition the markups would be identical if, if not for this revenue tax if you want to call it that Okay, and so one key thing that's emerged from this literature is this distinction. It was first raised, to my knowledge, by Foster, Haltwanger, and Severson, which is between revenue productivity and some underlying, underlying measure of, of, let's call it physical productivity or real productivity. Um, and here, revenue productivity would just be revenue per worker. And in this CES setting, this, in these special assumptions of constant returns to scale, which is production, linear, and labor, and, and CES, you, you get that revenue productivity does not reflect underlying uh, efficiency, this, this, uh, this A variable, um, which we can call TFPQ, it doesn't reflect that at all. There's like no relationship. Now, in, in other models, there'll be some correlation between TFPR and, TF, and, and TFPQ. And of course, if the tau happens to be like, go, like governments tax formal big firms more than they tax small firms, then tau would be positively correlated with TFPQ. But there's no... Um, endogenous underlying reason in, the, in this simple setup why TFPR would be connected to TFPQ. And that's kind of a, a stunning <laughs> um, uh, a stunning uh, feature or attribute of, of this model that will generalize in the sense of even if you move away from some of these stark assumptions, you'll get that TFPR isn't TFPQ. And if you wanted to measure underlying efficiency, you need something more than just revenue per unit of input. Um, because that might reflect things more like wedges or distortions or markups, which could be correlated with underlying efficiency, but are not the same. So that means if, for example, you were studying whether there's rapid learning by doing as a result of entering export markets, you'd want to look at TFPQ's evolution rather than TFPR. TFPR might be the, the markups, whether they evolve as you um, start exporting and learn from exporting. And if there's no relation between markups and that learning, you might not see anything, even though the underlying TFPQ might be soaring as a result of learning by exporting. Okay, so in this economy, real aggregate TFP, just output per unit of input, is some generalized mean of, of these underlying efficiencies, but then there's this sand in the gears, the, the, these wedges that are disrupting things. And you can't see it by staring at this equation, so I like to do the log normal case where it comes out really nicely, and then aggregate TFP or the log of it is a function of the mean of these A's. So a higher mean is good, that makes sense. In this case, if sigma is greater than one, then dispersion in A is good. And that's because implicit in this is that they're gonna pile more L and the economy will pile more L on top of the high A goods and production of high A goods. And we have some substitutability sigma. The higher that substitutability is, if that's greater than one, then the good, better this variance is for, the, for aggregate welfare because you can pour inputs onto, onto efficient goods. Um, and then if sigma is less than one, that, that's bad. But we need sigma greater than, meaning dispersion and productivity is bad because we can't substitute very well away from the high productivity. Um, I had the low, product, low efficiency firms, um, but if sigma is greater than one, we can substitute really easy to the high efficiency firm. That's where this term comes in, which is not my focus. My focus is more of this last term, which is saying the higher the variance of these tau's, 
these firm specific wedges or product specific wedges, the more damage that does. This negative means that's dragging down aggregate TFP. And so that is sand in the gears. This equation is showing that. So the more dispersion is bad in these wedges, but then high, higher elasticity is bad too, because the economy is going to respond more to these wedges. So you're going to reallocate inputs more, the higher is sigma, so you'll get more distortion out of it. So this is like the deadweight loss triangle, and it's bigger, the bigger the, the wedge, and the bigger the response of the economy to the wedge in terms of these sigmas. Again, this is a very special case um, where things uh, are, are very nice. For example, the correlation between tau and underlying A doesn't show up here, and that's a special property of a log normal. That doesn't survive um, very generally. Um, let me pause. It looks like there might be some questions already. Fire away, Dave. Thanks. Just asking a, a written question from the Q&A that has also intrigued me uh, in the past, too. So how would you think about the word friction relative to something like wedge and misallocation? If that's something you come to later, obviously, just feel free to shunt on it. Yeah, okay, so that's fair. I think of distortion as my favorite term, which I'm using wedge as a, as a proxy for that. And, and I guess I don't care for friction as much because I'm worried that would confuse real frictions like say real adjustment costs of moving capital across firms or real frictions in, in reallocating workers, they have to find a job, et cetera. Those, those are like gravity. Um, that are constraints that are that that you know any planner would face. They wouldn't want to subsidize the reallocation of capital, ignoring those frictions, those real frictions, or subsidized reallocation. So, just semantically, you know, I, I personally favor distortion over friction. Okay. Um, all right. So let me move on and say, okay. So what this is a very simple model. What do we what do we get from it? Um, well, wedges can show up in, in TFPR, not in TFPQ. TFPR is not the same as TFPQ, which I've already emphasized. Aggregate TFP is decreasing, decreasing, in, the, decreasing in the dispersion of these wedges. Aggregate TFP is unrelated to the mean wedge, but just in the special model where there's, say, a fixed number of firms. More generally, the average wedge would affect things like entry and, and have efficiency effects. And aggregate TFP is increasing the dispersion of TFPQ, because I mentioned that. So one comment I wanted to make right here, though, is that this is a special model where TFP has, TFPR has nothing to do with TFPQ, as I've mentioned, but um, any model you write down, say you wrote down uh, non-constant elasticity of substitution, so variable elasticity, and or you had non-monopolistic competition, so you had endogenously varying markups. You could do the same thing in that economy, which is back out, uh, there'd be an endogenous markup in that version. So sigma would have a sub i. It's a function of these non-CS preferences or this non-monopolistic competition market structure. So you'd have a richer model with some sigma i's here. Those would be themselves distortions. Those would be misallocating inputs for the standard monopolist produces too little arguments. The ones with the, the high markups would produce too little. But you could also back out a tau i. That wouldn't be the only distortion. You'd have an endogenous distortion here. You could back out the tau i and you could back out the ai. So if this setup seems really special, it's actually not that special in the sense that you can generalize everything and still back out you know, what the AIs and what the uh, tau Is are in the economy. And there might be some correlation between them, um, between say the sigma Is, the markups, endogenous markups in the A. So you still want to, dis but you still want to distinguish the wedge that's distorting things from the underlying efficiency. Okay. Um, so I think we get some insights from just this very simple setup. Okay, so a little bit more on this measurement wise. So the way I've done it, the one question is, well, how do we get, get information on this out real output? Um, if you have an individual unit price, which some data sets have, I would actually call that, um, if, you, if you had a measure of physical output, that's usually what they mean by um, having, having a unit price, is they might have an average unit price. They might have some measure of the quantities of production Q, and they can infer what I would call process efficiency, which is physical units of production divided by inputs. Um, but this notion of, of, of the AI that I wrote down, that could be quality. It doesn't need to, I wrote it down as if it was process efficiency, but it could easily be things like quality. Or if you're looking at a firm or a plant that produces multiple products, it could also be the variety of products that it produces. And in the CES framework, they're isomorphic. In other frameworks, they wouldn't be exactly the same, but, 
But conceptually, this AI can reflect much more than just physical process efficiency. Um, and then if you had, if you knew something about the demand elasticities, these could have sigma i's on them, you can back out from a firm's revenue its um, effective output, including the quality and the variety of what it's doing, or a plant's effective output. So I just wanted to distinguish my version of TFPQ has things like process efficiency and quality, or even within, within i variety in it. And that's distinct from this other separate object, which I think is also interesting, which is this process efficiency this, that you can get from physical productivity data. So if you know something about demand, you can infer effective output. So that can be really useful to get this broad measure of TFPQ. If you happen to have a data set where you have a quantity measure, then you can get process efficiency, which is also interesting, but isn't the only thing we care about in terms of underlying uh, 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 technology, which would have things like quality and variety in it. Okay, let me move on. Um, this I've already mentioned ways to generalize this model in terms of the market structure and in the and the um, and the demand and the elasticity of the demand, the variable versus constant. Let me make, just talk about some easy generalizations: to add fiscal capital, add intermediate goods, um, add wedges on all inputs. You know, so things like financial frictions, which might not be misallocation, I guess, by my my. Uh, term that I used a moment ago, they might show up, um, you could have those in, as wedges on, on all inputs, um, on any number of inputs. You can add things like overhead costs, and of course, you could have things like entry costs that, that make the M endogenous interesting. Okay, so there are many other generalizations, so financial frictions, I'm being inconsistent here, because I'm using, because I think, I think that's, there's some tension there in terms of financial frictions, which is that, um, if you, if you think about what the underlying source of the friction is, some of those frictions might be information frictions uh, or enforcement of contract frictions that get conditional on those, the government can't do any better than the banking system. Other ones might be such that if the government just subsidized, say, firms that had high um, average product of capital or, or value of the marginal product of capital, which is the more what we're really trying to get at, and, that, and, and Dave and David were very helpful in their slides and, and stressing that distinction, that what we're really caring about is the value of the marginal product of inputs, and it's high at one firm and low at another firm, or one good or another good, uh, the planner wants to reallocate. So um, depending on the exact source of the friction, the government could improve upon um, what the financial system does with certain targeted subsidies and, and, and other frictions that can. These are all models where, where um, the particular underlying source is such that there is misallocation, um, not just you know imperfect markets. Okay, so people have added adjustment costs. Um, again, those aren't necessarily things that um, the market can improve on. The planner would face those adjustment costs. So these were more kind of like, well, maybe it's not misallocation. Maybe it's adjustment costs. So I'll talk more about those papers if I have time. I already mentioned the variable markups, non-monopolistic competition. You can also add input-output matrix. The work of Bakayi, Bakayi and Fari was particularly uh, clarifying in this regard and generalizing. Okay, and I'll return to the um, to their paper in a bit. Okay, so that's the what I wanted to do at the outset. Um, I know there's a raised hand, so let me let me uh, see what Brian wants uh, wants to say. Hello, Peter. Um, nice to meet you. Hi, Dave. Hi, Dave. I was just wondering, since you mentioned this paper by Moll, I seem to remember that there, there was kind of a, a role of the, in the long term. I mean, I seem to remember that this, the amount of misallocation or the amount of distortion, depending on the persistence of the frictions and the persistence of the productivity. So I am wondering in this, in this general setting, these distortions that you are calling can somehow be endogenized, or if we can see if depending on the government actions, they can increase, or if they, or if we can expect them to disappear in the long run. Okay, so I think the point you were making about Mall's paper was that he was describing, imagine two polar cases, imagine that firm specific shocks were IID, and that there's a lag in adjusting capital uh, to the current productivity, and there's nothing that can be done. If it's perfect, uh, I'm sorry, uh, permanent differences in productivity across firms, then eventually, even if you can't get external financing uh, perfectly because of financial frictions or the nature of the banking system or the, or the um, incentive problems or repayment pro uh, enforcement, 
issues, then firms would still self-finance in the long run. So that's the point. I just wanted to reiterate what you were saying that one of all's key points is if there was a, a ton of persistence, then the economy in the long run would, would reallocate capital on its own through internal savings, and so you wouldn't have misallocation. So he was emphasizing, you know, it really depends on how much persistence there is. So people have tended to find enough persistence that, that there's still some capital misallocation. So it doesn't go away in the long run. There's these ongoing shocks such that you, at any point in time, the financial system isn't reallocating enough. You have this mismatch where some people have the wealth, but not the good investment projects. Other people don't have the wealth, but have good investment projects. So the, the presence of ongoing shocks seems to be enough to generate misallocation that persists. Having said that, one of my facts that I'm going to talk about We'll come back to this about like how persistent these wedges are. Um, they're a little too persistent to be adjustment costs um, or even maybe financial frictions, a bunch of them. Okay, thanks. Um, let me see if there's any other questions before moving on to examples. Okay, Ali? Hi, I have a few questions. First of all, the data used to investigate misallocation are usually related to industry section. Uh, can this data represent the entire economy? Uh, second, can different sorts of misallocation uh, be prioritized for policy making? Is there a method to decompose misallocation, such as measuring barriers to uh, economic growth? Finally, uh, TFE has two factors, efficiency and technology. Uh, apart from misallocation, the literature about the efficiency factor also uh, includes other subjects such as uh, unproductive activities and idle resources and so on. And as far as I know, no suitable numerical indicators uh, has been introduced to measure them. Uh, is it correct to attribute efficiency fluctuations to misallocation? Uh, does efficiency emerge in a measurable way other than misallocation? Thank you. Okay, so the first uh, issue I think you raised is that a lot of the data sets that we've used so far have been for manufacturing. And I think that is a constraint that we have fewer data sets for things like the agricultural sector and especially outside agriculture and manufacturing. And those are quite big and often much bigger than manufacturing. So I think that's a limitation so far of the literature. It's also an opportunity for anybody, uh, any students listening to this, that um, if you have access to a data set on the service sector in India or in Mexico, I know there's a couple that I've, I've seen some work on in those particular countries. So it suggests misallocation, if anything, bigger in the service sector. Um, agriculture, that's an ongoing debate, how much misallocation there is in agriculture, um, but obviously really important for developing countries to study this in the agricultural sector, absolutely. Um, policy, I think I'm gonna get to that in a little, a little bit later. You know, the I think the modest, humble thing I want to say is that that we don't have that we've nailed what these tows are, and there's a lot of different things that can contribute to tau. I'm just about to give you some examples, and without knowing exactly which policies, we can't tell policymakers what to do. So I think this is still mostly at the basic research stage. That doesn't do justice to some papers out there. For example, um, Atkin, Faber, and Gonzalez Navarro um, studied what what um, FDI and the retail sector in Mexico did to productivity and welfare of different groups, that has a pretty clear policy implication. And you could say, if there's policies that inhibit uh, FDI, those are you know, generating some misallocation on a, on a, in terms of um, different types of firms. So I think there's many exceptions to that, but it's more like a hand-to-hand -hand combat thing that individual studies talking about individual policies that can be reformed and improved. I'm gonna be taking more of this complementary approach, which is less policy, less directly relevant for policy, which is to say, how much room is there for misallocation? How do we think about different categories of misallocation rather than talk about exactly the, the policy implications that, that, that follow? Um, your, your third one about um, idle resources is really interesting. Maybe we can talk about that more uh, offline. I won't have much more to, much to say about that today. Okay, so touching on a little bit on, on, on what was just mentioned, and I wanted to mention some things that aren't misallocation. So I, I already mentioned um, things like unavoidable adjustment costs or transportation costs. One hazard in this data is there's lots of measurement error. So a lot of this variation, if you back out the TAUs or even the TFPQs, a bunch of it is coming from just mismeasurement of the revenue and inputs. And that's um, there's some ways to try to tackle that, but that's 
that's like a, a major caveat, I think. There's also things like if you back out and it looks like a firm has a high um, mar value of marginal product um, of, say, capital, um, maybe that's coming from risk. Maybe that's the planner wouldn't want to want more capital and labor allocated to that activity because it's risky relative to other ones. And that's a perfectly functioning market would do that. Similarly, with labor, there could be compensating differentials so that the value of the marginal product of labor lifts low in one activity, but that's because workers are getting lots of amenities to, to being there. And some will have high values of marginal products, and, and uh, that's because of disamenities. Um, so the market might be functioning fine. You would gain, in a welfare sense, from reallocating inputs if they reflect compensating differentials. And then kind of a general thing is, you know, any 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 specification of a model and backing out of an A and a tau is going to be subject to if those if the model's misspecified in terms of preferences, market structure, technologies, and that includes the production function. So one big category I think there's been less work on than there should is heterogeneity and production elasticities, say across plants or across firms with, within industries, there's bound to be a lot of that. And we wouldn't want to mislabel um, that as misallocation of capital or misallocation of labor. And that's really important, of course, distinguishing the misallocation from these technology differences um, in terms of inferring gains that be had from misallocation, potentially policy implications. Okay, so you know, what do I have in mind? Well, I, I, I literally talked about a revenue tax. Those do differ in things like subsidies. They differ across firms, across industries, across um, sizes of firms. Um, so in subsidies as well, um, there's things like size dependent regulations that, that are kind of an effective shadow tau that are hitting some firms more than others. Um, their markup differences are so these might sound very Republican saying, you know, these wedges are, are government induced and, and but these are like market failures. So there can be government policies that are that are generating the distortions and they could be market imperfections that are generating these distortions. So markup differences, wage markdown differences, and growing interest in that. I think most of that work is, is in developed countries. So I'd like to see um, a lot more work in, in developing countries. I'm not a micro development person, so maybe more than I realize. But from the macro development literature that I know a little bit better, there seems to be a lot of opportunity to study um, markdown differences more in developing countries. OK. Um, so there's many other potential sources. I mentioned financial frictions, but you can also think of state-owned um, banks. You can think of just cronyism. Um, you can think of things like discrimination, and I'm going to give an example of that. And, and that can be occur in many different forms um, that could generate misallocation. Um, things like efficiency wages. When I was first taught that, I thought that was um, one of those things the market couldn't improve on, because if there's a monitoring problem and workers um, need to be paid efficiency wages in order to induce uh, more effort, then how can how can the planner improve upon that? But it turns out if the planner knows that certain firms or sectors uh, face uh, more monitoring problems than others, then they can actually subsidize those sectors and, and increase welfare. So that's a category that, I mean, it's a bit of an outdated literature, but I don't know why exactly. It seems like it should be revived. There's all kinds of things like land use restrictions. These are more like policy related um, and then you can think of this is the sense in which this is like all of economics. Is there misallocation? Is there is there the right allocation of resources? So you can think of misallocation of R&D and infrastructure. And that's one way in which, you know, if you think about um, saying, oh, there's there's transportation costs and therefore that you can't call that misallocation that's generating wedges across space. But if there's a government investments in infrastructure are suboptimal, then that's a form of misallocation that will reduce uh, those wedges and, and may generate welfare gains. And of course, there can be externalities of all kinds that, that as, as well known, generate misallocation. I think I'll see if there's another question now. There's some popping up. Or not. Um, feel free to raise a hand at any point. Um, okay, so one paper to send up, okay, it looks like there's uh, somebody raised their hand. Hi. Yeah, there's one question in the Q&A chat. They got three upvotes um, okay. on misallocation and competition. It says, is there a conflict between policies trying to reduce misallocation and increase competition? If so, how can we resolve this? For example, could we reduce misallocation by giving all resources to a few of the most productive firms, or would that reduce competition with the usual negative effects? I mean, that, that's really interesting. Um, 
So, yeah, I mean, certain models like variable markups, like there's a nice paper by um, Bohr and Midrigan on this, Karina Bohr and Virgilia Midrigan, that talks about a tension between, you know, you mentioned competition, but also uh, just inequality. That if you, if the most efficient entrepreneurs or most productive firms are owned and you don't have completely diversified ownership, then subsidizing those. So if, if they have high markups, they're not going to produce enough. So if you solve that by subsidizing them, you're going to subsidize the most profitable, wealthy entrepreneurs, owners, et cetera. So, but you mentioned competition, but I think the idea is, hey, uh, by just subsidizing them, you get them to produce the right amount. So um, you're already pushing against the, the market uh, m markups being higher at those big firms. And so even though you're making competition even less, the subsidy is trying to offset the distortion from that. So I think there's a trade-off there, not only with, with, with having to think about what its endogenous impact on competition, which you mentioned, but also on inequality. And I'll, I'll return to that if, if I have time. I think that's a, a, a highly relevant. So there, there are other things that where misallocation might be increasing inequality. And this is an example of that. Um, this is a work I did with Cheng Tai Shea, a frequent collaborator, uh, Eric Hurst, and Chad Jones. And we were just pointing out something that there's a voluminous literature on, which is that there's been some occupational convergence across skill, that high-skilled occupations, which you could measure as high wage, you could measure as high education, um, were dominated by white men more in the past than recently. So there's still inequality. And if you did this for economics, it would be more stark. We just did white versus black because we could; those categories were consistently measured back in time. We wanted to go back a far way, but there's many other categories um, in more recent data that where you could break things out. And there was, you know, disproportionately white men in these high-skilled occupations in 1960, still disproportionate, but the, the ratios were, were um, far less, less unequal. And so we argued this was misallocation or is consistent with misallocation, that there's talent to be a lawyer, doctor, economist that was distributed the same on in men versus women, white versus black. And so these numbers should be in an efficient economy with no misallocation should be should be equal and they're more equal now. So maybe there's less misallocation of talent now than there used to be. And we tried to we tried to quantify that. And so we said that these patterns consistent with falling discrimination can generate gains. If people have comparative advantage and there's people who were born to, you know, with the ability to be doctors more than better than to be nurses. But if all men were the doctors and all women were the nurses, that's going to misallocate a bunch of talent. So, so we said it may have accounted for this reduced discrimination may have accounted for a, a significant chunk of growth in GDP per capita, less in, in GDP per worker, because a bunch of the gains we think came, came took the form of increasing labor force participation of women. So this gap between the 25 and 40 is it may have contributed to rising GDP more than rising GDP per worker, because a bunch of it was increasing workers per capita. Um, there's the question of whether all those gains have been realized, obviously not all of them, but how big are the remaining gains? Um, and in, the gains might be big. You know, an example is a student of mine, John Felix Bruyere, who has a paper on, on women inventors, arguing that that, uh, that misallocation is still quite large. There's still lar large gains to be had from equalizing um, you know, opportunities and access to becoming researchers by, um, by gender. Okay, and that's in the U.S. in that study. Arguably, that's going to be even bigger in, in other countries. Okay, um, so anyway, this is a, just a nice example of illustrating that even though a lot of my discussion will be about firms and plants, um, or for that matter, manufacturing, that these concepts can be applied to um, not just non-manufacturing uh, firms and plants, but uh, other aspects like like allocation of people across occupations. Okay. Um, now I want to say, you know, there's a literature on this. What are some broad facts that have been uncovered? Um, some patterns that seem to be common across a number of the studies. And then certainly have I want to have to make sure I have time for um, promising directions for future research. Okay, so what are these five facts? So this lists them, but I'm going to talk about them in some detail. So let me just go straight to that next. The first one is that TFPR, this measure of revenue per unit of inputs, is quite dispersed across um, plants within industries. So uh, this is the US distribution. Um, and the, the one hazard in this is that the samples aren't quite the same. So in the US, this is all employers in manufacturing. In China, this is in, in the state of plants. In China, these are actually firms. 
um, and their firms above a certain size threshold. Picture about you know 25 workers. And India, same thing. It's above a size threshold that's somewhere between um, you know, you know or somewhere around 25 workers, depending on the year. So, and it, and they're in India, they're closer to plants. Um, so we have some apples and oranges to these comparisons, but I would argue that, you know, to the extent that subsequent literature, other than this picture, has, has brought in the informal sector of smaller firms, smaller uh, in India, they've gotten even more dispersion. So, so and then I would argue probably the same would be true of China. So th the ways in which these data sets are inconsistent probably understates the difference in dispersion between China, India, and the U.S. here. And you do see, even despite these, these uh, discrepancies in the sample, that the U.S. distribution is much less dispersed. There's a ton of dispersion in the U.S., which is interesting. So you could just look at that and say that's consistent with a lot of misallocation because, um, you know, these are differences of a factor of four in revenue per unit of input. So you have to ask where are those where are those coming from? Are those are those real? Are there me measurement error? In which case they're not real gains to be had. Um, are they uh, adjustment costs? In which case you can't necessarily improve upon it. Or they do things like markups, which would mean, or markdowns, which would mean massive misallocation. Okay. Um, so, but the fact that people have found very consistently, it's, it's kind of the richer countries tend to have narrower distributions of TFPR and poorer countries have wider distributions. Um, so that's consistent with distortions being bigger in, in developing countries and then dragging down aggregate TFP in developing countries and maybe contributing to, the, to why they're underdeveloped relative to, say, OECD economies. Okay, um, so if you say how much, you know, if you try to translate this into this, if you use some of the, like the, the simple model, I, there was a formula that came out in terms of how TFP is related to the variance of TFPR, and you can generalize that to non-normal distribution to, to, to include things like capital and labor separately. If you do that in China in 1998 compared to the U.S. in 1998, in India in 1994 compared to the U.S. in 1994, you get... In manufacturing, these gaps aren't as big as for the whole economy. So maybe agriculture is playing a disproportionate role here. So if you're if you're wondering why the U.S. has only two to three times higher TFP than China and India in those years, that's because it's looking at manufacturing. And the differences in allocative efficiency, taking these TFPR differences naively as not reflecting measurement error at all, are are big. So they're somewhere about a half of the story and in uh, US and China in, in the log space and a third of the story in, in India. So it looks like there's room for a, a bunch of misallocation that's actually happening here um, that might be contributing to these differences in TFP in a non-trivial way. And then it's interesting to see what happened over time. And in India, they didn't go down over time. If anything, over this sample, we, we chose this particular sample in this study that I had with Chang because we had a comparable definition of industries here. Uh, and there were a bunch of reforms in the middle of the sample for India. So we were surprised. We thought that part of India's rapid growth in recent decades would have come from um, reducing things like licensing restrictions that would cause uh, reallocation that would mitigate misallocation and cause aggregate TFP to grow. So it's interesting that, that, that we find it actually got worse over this, this sub-period. Over longer periods, and with more recent data, it's more flat. Um, but again, surprising that it hasn't improved. And then in China, it's misallocation seems to have fallen about 2% a year over this, this sample. And if you look at actual TFP growth, it's only about a third of actual TFP growth from China in this, this interpretation. In India, it looks it's kind of interesting because if you think about why did they have such low TFP growth, maybe one of the reasons was, was this. This is surprising, too, because I would have thought TFP would have, growth would be a big source of, of India's rapid growth. Okay. Um, and then you can ask, you know, where is this coming from? This is probably the closest thing I'll say to directing, directly relating these misallocation measures to policy. If you look at state-owned enterprises, which shrank as a share of the economy, and their TFP gap between surviving state-owned enterprises and private enterprises, that shrunk. So they privatized the most inefficient ones, or, or they exited, most inefficient state-owned enterprises with the lowest TFPR. And then the ones that survived um, they expose them more to, to market pressure. And so their TFPR gap, so they might, might just say they reduced their subsidies. And so the TFPR gap shrank. And that's of the, say, 15% increase in TFP that we estimate from reduced misallocation, about 40% of that, six percentage points of the 15, seem to come from state-owned enterprises. So again, we all know that there was a shift away from state-owned enterprises. You can imagine that increased productivity. 
what's useful about this is it's trying to quantify exactly that contribution. Um, so it's interesting that it looks, looks big, but not the whole story of, of China's miraculous growth. Okay, let me um, <clears throat> okay, let me say one more thing before opening up to questions, some more questions, which is, so Chang and I studied China and India versus the US. People have studied other, um, other countries. The, the Inter-American Development Bank had a study of many Latin American countries. Michael Peters studied Indian manufacturing. Uh, Diego Restucia and collaborators have, have done a lot of studies for at the agricultural sector in places like Malawi and, and China and, and uh, elsewhere that I'll touch on if I can later. And it's pretty consistent, this finding that misallocation is, is large. It seems to be larger in developing countries than in uh, developed countries. So that's why this is probably their most robust fact out there. Um, these are like 37 countries. Some countries are, are studied repeatedly in different years here, so it's not completely independent just to try to see what's the broad pattern. And um, if you estimate a line through this, this is relative TFP compared to the US. So the US is one and, and, and the US doesn't have perfect allocative efficiency. So the US is at like something like 75%. This allocative efficiency is the inverse of the, miss the gains that you could achieve through misallocation. So if you're point if you're 50% allocative efficiency, you could double output by reallocating capital and labor, potentially in this naive interpretation of the data with no measurement there. So this is showing it's not perfectly correlated with, with TFP across countries, but it's, it's somewhat correlated. So if you run a regression, you get an elasticity of 0.4, you know, not a, you know, there's some the noise in that. So you, one temptation would be to say maybe 40% of the differences in TFP could come from differences in the allocative efficiency, which if true would be huge. So many caveats in that. The T, this measure of misallocative efficiency is for manufacturing, except for a few studies of agriculture and some of services. There and, the, um, and then uh, the sample frames differ, which I already mentioned. That's that's a problem. These use one heroic sigma. It's arguably too low, which would mean the misallocation is being understated. But there's a, probably a lot of heterogeneity in this across sectors, and so you'd want to incorporate that in a more careful study. Um, I'm taking studies off the shelf, and they all they all happen to use the same sigma. Measurement error could be worse in poorer countries, and again, too few studies outside outside manufacturing. Okay. Um, this is a study across Mexican states that th this has misallocation rather than allocative efficiency. And it's saying the, the states with higher GDP per capita have less dispersion in TFPR across um, firms. And that's associated with less misallocation in the richer, richer states. So again, some broad suggestive evidence that this is contributing in a, in a big way, not just these country by country studies of calculating the potential gains from misallocation, but, but observing that it looks like Misallocation might be bigger in, in developing countries and contributing in a sizable way to, to income gaps. Okay, um, maybe I'll stop now. To, for, pause now for a second for for questions. Okay. All right, Cincy. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name right, but. Yeah, I'm Zinsi from Northwestern. I have a question on the production function and electricities. Would you think it makes sense to borrow some like the new method from IO literature on production function estimation to sort of more clearly uh, look into this kind of um, measurements uh, related in the uh, macro development literature or not? Absolutely, I think you're you're right. There's this burgeoning literature on production function estimation um, that's made a lot of progress. Um, that there could be, there's an arbitrage opportunity, which is to, to take that and say, to what extent is that generating, is there heterogeneity in these production elasticities? Um, so that, you know, some of this dispersion in let's say the value of the, mar the marginal product of capital versus labor that, that you would get under a constant elasticity assumption is in fact, just the heterogeneity in the elasticity. So it would narrow, I would think, would narrow the, dis the dis dispersion in the value of the marginal products and the question is how much and, and country by country. So that's that's an opportunity. Yeah, I mean, one, one comment I wanted to say about that literature, because I'm not a direct contributor, I'm kind of more of a consumer. Uh, I tend to use like just cost shares, but you need constant returns to, to, to estimate production elasticities, but you need two strong assumptions there at least. Um, you need uh, competitive input markets with maybe three strong. You need constant returns to scale and you need some measure of the cost of capital. So, but that's the way I, I go at it. Um, 
And but I'm a consumer of watching what's happening in these production function elasticity papers. And one thing I was going to say is I really like the papers that lay out the environment and also show uh, the environment in which their estimator is consistent and also kind of demonstrate that it works. You know, like in other words, if you generate data from that model, that the estimator comes up with the, the true production elasticities and the data generating mechanisms. So that's just some good practice that I've seen in, in, in some of the papers and really admire. Okay. Um, one comment I wanted to get back to, you know, size of misallocation might be big. This study is, is, ask, is making a really interesting point. This is Baka and Farhi again, which is, you know, with Chang and I were often asked this question, we didn't have a good answer, which was, I thought from the classic work of Arnold Harberger that deadway loss triangles were small. The cost of monopoly were less than 1% of GDP. The fact that some industries or some firms were monopolists and other firms weren't, that was just trivial. That was just second order. Um, so Baki and Farhi point out, you know, they get, say, 20% misallocation in, U in the U.S. And that's not just manufacturing, by the way. They're looking at CompuStat firms, many of, the majority of which aren't. And they did a really nice thing, which was decompose how they're able to get a number that's 100 times bigger than Harburger's number. And one of the reasons was, if you look within industries, the wedges are bigger than if you look across industries. So if you look like electricity versus um, manufacturing, the average wedge differences aren't big. But if you look within uh, manufacturing, you might see big differences in markups. And same thing with within electricity provision, you might see massive differences in markups. So there's much bigger uh, wedges uh, within than across industries. And critically, remember the, the losses due to misallocation are increasing in substitutability. So if Harburg was focusing more on most on like electricity versus manu manufacturing, there's not that much substitutability between them, but there's a lot of substitutability between different manufacturing firms or products. And so any distortions can do a lot more damage. So the wedges, the distortions are bigger. The damage to the distortions are, is bigger because more substitutability. And then they get a bunch of propagation from the input output net network as well, which obviously relates to a lot of their work. Um, Jim Schmitz has a bunch of work on this that's, it's even other dimensions in which um, monopoly can do damage, you know, by limiting entry, by limiting the uh, technology used by competitors, and on and on. So I think he's on to lots of channels by which monopolies might be doing doing damage. Okay, um, I think this was mentioned by Dave and David in their uh, introductory lecture. There's more TFP to TFPQ dispersion, that's kind of a corollary in developing countries, so I'll, I'll skip over that. They also mentioned that, that distortions seem to be size dependent. This is one version of that. This is TFPR uh, in a plant relative to the industry mean in India, and this is the TFPQ of that plant. So you can see a very strong positive relationship. You'd also get this with measurement error and revenue or input, so that's, that's a big caveat to a plot like this. But one thing that's interesting is this is much steeper in rich countries than in, in much flatter, and I'm sorry, much steeper in developing countries and flatter, uh, but still positive in, in, in rich countries. So as much as people are talking about big firms have high markups in the US, there's evidence consistent with an even stronger relationship in places like India. Okay. Um, one interesting side aspect of this is that if you think about distortions rising in um, productivity, that might affect incentives, dynamic incentives to invest in productivity. So Bento and Rustusha have a really nice demonstration of that in their AJ Macro. Um, also, Al Akchi, Alp and Peters have a nice example of how this firms won't replicate themselves into more units if there's a, they had in particular um, enforcement uh, problem that, that meant that an entrepreneur couldn't delegate, start opening up new um, new establishments and so firms would be smaller. So that would, that might apply even though they're, um, the data they used was for manufacturing that could apply easily to non-manufacturing where multi-establishment firms are quite common, things like retail and services. Um, and then of course, entry can affect entry too. Um, there's some nice papers on that. Okay, um, so this is a version of this, which is what? how does TFPQ, this is average employment, so it's an input, but if you, the implicit thing that we looked at explicitly in the paper, but this is just a more transparent way to show it is to say average employment. If you normalize the youngest firms to one and then look at older firms, they're much bigger in the US, kind of they grow in Mexico and then India, very little growth. And if you construct a TFPQ measure, it looks like this as well. So it looks like TFPQ rises more with age in the US than in Mexico or India. 
and people have filled in more countries since then. One interesting thing is that a lot of countries are just here in the middle. So the US looks like an outlier, even relative to places like Germany. And India looks like an outlier on the low side, even you know, like relative to Mexico and many other countries that are in here. So, but there, this is, illustrates that um, misallocation can have these dynamic implications that affect firms' incentives to grow large as they, they age. And it could be to what extent they're opening multi, um, multi-establishment locations or improving the, the process efficiency or the quality or, or, or variety of their products um, as they age. Okay. Um, all right. So a third fact. So the first fact was that the, the distortions appear bigger in developing countries, and that contributes potentially sizably to the underdevelopment. The second fact was that um, the, the size, the distortion seems size dependent. And so that can do maybe direct damage in terms of misallocation, but also have this indirect potentially powerful effect on TFPQ and the distribution of TFPQ and the average level of TFPQ in the economy and affect you know, the technology term. That's one way to say it. Misallocation may have a direct um, reduction in output relative to inputs, but it also may affect technology um, and that could be could do further damage. So the third fact is that, um, is that scale dis distortions appear to be more important than mixed distortion. And this terminology I'm borrowing from Davey, Dave, uh, Joel David, uh, and, and Venki at uh, NYU, which is um, scale they called was a common component of here I should really have in the data we're measuring the value of the average products of capital, labor, and, and intermediates, X is for intermediates here. But as emphasized by Dave and David, what we really are trying to get at is the marginals. So here that we're just, I'm just um, reporting what they report, which is about averages, and they're hoping there's are informative about marginals. So they were pointing out and they looked um, I looked in China and the U.S. at firms, and and they found that the scale dis dispersion was bigger and more important than mixed dispersion. And this is mix would be in ratios of things like the average product of capital to labor. So what could what would show up in the scale be common to all of them? Well, uh, markups in the output market, um, revenue taxes and subsidies, and of course measurement error that was common to all inputs or or hit revenue. And it, but it does say that maybe the the that there's big distortions beyond just financial frictions that would show up, you think, in the capital labor ratio or risk that isn't a distortion, but just a compensating differential that would show up in the capital labor ratio or things like wage markdowns. If, that were the, if any one of these were the dominant source of TFPR dispersion, you should see it in the mix and not in the, the scale. Um, okay, so this is an example of that. Um, so, you know, th 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 even though we did a different calculation, and it, it's nice for illustrating this. So suppose what we did is we said, here's allocative efficiency and in, say India and, or sorry, these are the gains from reallocation. Yeah, if you reallocated inputs to the same extent that, if you reduced misallocation so that it was the US level, India would have a 59% higher TFP and China 31% higher in, in these years that we looked at. This is assuming no heterogeneity in production elasticities. Here we assumed all mixed distortions was really heterogeneity in production elasticities. So that's kind of like saying there is no misallocation, there's no mixed distortion. And you can see that reduced the, the amount of misallocation but the majority of it was remaining. So this is our studies in China and India, which were more firms here and plants here, um, illustrate this. And then, uh, but, but there, there's David Venke's study of US and China found the same thing. Okay, so another fact I wanted to emphasize is that these TFPR differences look pretty persistent. And most of the variance in them is, looks like a permanent component as opposed to a transitory component. So, so um, David Venke emphasized this uh, at these U.S. company step firms and in Chinese firms as well. Um, in a paper I had with um, Mark Bills at the B and Key and Ron, um, we found the same thing for Indian plants and U.S. plants and manufacturing. Okay, so I would say, why would it be persistent? Well, it's not really consistent with the dominant role for financial friction. So this ties into this question earlier about can firms save their way out of financial frictions? Well, in the, in the presence of ongoing shocks, no. There's always going to be this misallocation in the cross section, um, or or just dispersion in, in marginal products that are unavoidable if 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 you can't improve on these financial frictions, policy can't improve on it. Um, but uh, at any loan firm that had like a big positive shock then capital is going to adjust. So in any one firm, there should be mean reversion 
a lot of mean reversion in their average product of capital or hopefully their value of the marginal product of capital and, and therefore their TFPR. So the fact that we see very persistent differences isn't consistent with big financial frictions or for that matter, adjustment costs. Some firm has a positive shock and then it's gonna have a high average product of capital, value of the marginal product of capital, hopefully, but it's it, the reason it's not investing more is because there's adjustment costs. And you should see that slowly fade over time. So the fact that these differences are so persistent says, well, maybe it's something that's not going away like a markup. A price cost markup could be persistent. A measurement error could be persistent too. Things like taxes or subsidies could be persistent. So this isn't, you know, this misallocation that, that, that this literature is finding is so massive potentially. There's plenty of room for big distortions from financial frictions um, or mark, markdowns and other sources that would show up in the mix uh, and, be, and be relatively transitory for some of them like financial frictions. Um, but, but it does say maybe the bulk of the actions in something like uh, persistent markups. Okay, um, the last, well, let me pause, see if there's um, questions or comments. Ali again. Hi, uh, I had a question about uh, TFPR. Uh, on the uh, one hand, the TFPR represents productivity. On the other hand, it represents markup for monopolistic price-making companies. Uh, what exactly does this uh, index mean? Is it uh, have a uh, dual behavior or something. Okay, I guess I would say it, it's more closely related to, and then the simple model I wrote, it would be only related to the distortion or measurement error. Um, so, it, but that might endogenously be correlated with underlying TFPQ. So I think the first thing would be to say, you know, you really want to think of TFPR as a distortion and then estimate TFPQ separately. So if you really want to get at TFPQ, don't use TFPR as a perfect proxy for that. That's that's the kind of main reaction that I have um, to that. That even though they're correlated, um, that they're not the same. And so if you really want to get at TFPQ, then try to measure that 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 distinctly. Um, okay. Also open to other questions. This one pops up. Um, okay. So the uh, last yeah, fact, and this is yeah, less well documented. I, sorry. Yep. Um, sorry, just asking a written Q and A question from uh, Victor. It goes back a little while, but I, at some point, I think it would be interesting for you to comment on it. So um, he writes, uh, I was wondering if differences in technology between countries, uh, for example, agricultural innovations for the U.S. may be, not be directly used in India, and the cost of adapting them to a different context could be captured as misallocation. That's a really good question. I mean, one angle I would have is that, you know, is there misallocation globally in innovation because of differences in property rights? You know, like, is there less innovation into agricultural or health interventions that would be particularly helpful in developing countries? And you can imagine this is something Michael Kramer has emphasized, um, Jacob Moscona's recent work too, um, that, that, it, there's a, that there's a potential that better intellectual property rights could improve the allocation of, of research in a way that would be have a big effect on agricultural productivity or health in developing countries in particular. And you know that that that's a possibility. So that's one reaction I have to that. Um, so one thing I skipped over it, but the, the, the fact that TFPQ dispersions were different is, is, to, is to emphasize that we weren't imposing that the TFPQ distributions were the same. We weren't assuming countries had the same technology. And in, in fact, I was kind of emphasizing that the distortion, misallocation and market imperfections and government policy distortions could themselves affect the technology distri distribution. And I guess that's where I was going in responding to this question. Um, but, you know, it, it does, it, you know, I'm not an expert on technology adoption and agriculture in developing countries, but it's fascinating for me to, as an observer to think about how our approach is like, why isn't this being adopted? And it seems like one of the lessons from that literature is people are behaving pretty optimally given the environment they're, they're in. So 
but that includes some things like information frictions of not knowing exactly what you know what fertilizer to use or what how to use the new hybrid seeds and what the payoff to be them to be etc that's a tricky area too which is information frictions which because the government might be able to improve on those but it might also you know not be able to depending on how um anyway so i think that your question brings up a whole host of interesting interesting things so i'm glad glad to um glad i got to hear it okay um this last fact which i would say i'd like to see more documentation of it i'd like to see it documented for labor I'd like to see it documented for other countries but Kerrigan and Vincent have this fascinating point where they say in U.S. manufacturing across plants, most of the dispersion in the average product of capital, I just say this because that's what they're measuring. Again, we, we're, we're hoping this is reflecting the value of the marginal product of capital, but without production elasticities, we can't quite, um, can't quite get, get there. But we're using, they're using this as a proxy. They say most of this dispersion is across plants within firms. So one reaction to this was, well, it can't be financial frictions then because a firm it's facing external financial frictions, but internally it should allocate its own capital efficiently. Now that's that's a leap. So so maybe that's not true. In fact, they they have a a, a subtle argument, which is that the this gap within firms is reflecting financial frictions interacted with lumpy adjustment costs. So imagine there's this these, these non-convex adjustment costs for capital, and these big investment projects. Then that you're going to do. If you face financial frictions, you're not going to do them all at once across the firms, across the plants within firms, you're going to stagger them. So because of the financial frictions, you're going to see more dispersion. And that's optimal given the financial frictions and the adjustment cost. But there are going to be gains to limiting the financial frictions that might show up in, um, in reducing this, this uh, dispersion. Um, but I would also like to emphasize, you know, there's things like plant-specific markups. They're, you know, different carb models being produced at different plants. Within a, within a manufacturing firm, they may have different markups. And that's why there'll be very persistent differences in the average product of capital across those plants within firms. And of course, which would not be misallocation, the production elasticities could vary across plants within firms. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for seeing to what extent this is true for labor as well as capital, to what extent it's true in other countries and figuring out what the source of it is. So I think this is a great paper for for pointing out this fact and, and a potential interpretation of it, but they've, um, I'm hoping it also leads to a bunch of follow-up work. Okay, um, now I want to, I'm glad I, I, I have at least almost half an hour to devote to you know, not just what people have documented already, even though I've touched on some opportunities to do more, the things like outside manufacturing in, in particular, and but I want to emphasize you know, where I think the most exciting work is most recently and, and, and potentially in the near future. Okay, so I put it into three categories, and one relates to something that was brought up earlier, which is how does this relate to policy? So if you tie misallocation to explicit policies and distortions, then the policy implications for that are, are more clear. Um, and the other is like better identification. So the approach that I've taken is, like I said, more like looking at, at, at samples that, of the whole population and just asking how much room is there for misallocation. Which isn't very very direct in terms of policy implications, but also, you know, you, it's not very clear. But the closest I got to a policy experiment would be that when I said that the shrinking of state-owned enterprises in China seemed to contribute X amount, forty percent of their gains in, in allocative efficiency, and contributed this much to TFP growth. Um, and then a third category that I want want to talk about is is how inequality trades off or or doesn't with misallocation. Okay, so explicit policies. So remember, misallocation is is allocative is a, the flip side of allocative efficiency. So it's all of economics. So not surprisingly, there are many papers written decades before Chang and I talked about this. Um, you know, they, they talk about you know uh, misallocation. So Hoppenheim and Rogerson talk about firing costs in Italy causing labor to be misallocated and trying to quantify that misallocation. Um, there are many studies preceding us and and proceeding us, that preceding proceeding us about size-dependent regulations in developing countries or developed countries, advanced economies, and how that might misallocate uh, labor. Garacano et al. are looking in particular in more recent work at, at dynamic implications of this. Does it affect incentives of firms to increase their productivity and find sizable um, distortions as a result of it? There's the, the differences in tax rates across U.S. states that lead to a non-trivial amount of of misallocation, it looks like. And then this is one of my favorite recent studies by um, Cavalcanti, Kabaski, Martins, and Santos, which is that a lot of the 
financial friction work on, on misallocation or just on financial frictions um, has a model and then observes some data. Um, and then often the implication is that there's like a shadow interest rate that might differ across firms. Some firms are rationed, other firms aren't, but there might not be an explicit interest rate difference being charged across firms. So they document um, using banking data in, in Brazil, big differences in the interest rates charged across firms, um, across borrowers in Brazil. And so, you know, one direction to go with that is how much is that it's default risk? And they argue it's not default risk. Um, and there's also how much does it reflect risk more generally? And they argue, again, it's not. They argue what's happening is, is actually monopsony power on the part of the banks. The banks are charging high interest rates to more profitable firms. And one thing that's really interesting about that is that that implies that there'll be less saving out of um, this distortion over time. So they, 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 get, they get rationing still occurs. They get this explicit variation in the, in the cost of capital. And because the efficient firm, say it's a small productive firm is trying to grow, if it's being charged high interest rates to, to, to borrow more, then that's going to reduce its profitability, net of interest costs, and reduce its ability to save its way out of this financial friction. So I think it's a, just a great paper in terms of the quality of the data, allowing us to see something we normally don't see, and then potentially major implications for um, allocative efficiency, or at least aggregate TFP. That reminds me, one thing I didn't say that I wanted to say that I really like to say is that suppose governments can't do anything about financial frictions or adjustment costs, but suppose those financial frictions are bigger in some environment than another. That's still going to affect aggregate TFP. If adjustment costs are bigger in one economy than another, or, or even the size of the adjustment costs the same, but the shocks are bigger hitting firms. So the, that'll generate more dispersion in TFPR. And that, even though it's not misallocation, will lower aggregate TFP. So things like adjustment costs and financial frictions, those are real frictions that are affecting real aggregate TFP, even if the government can't do anything about it, even if they're the, the constrained optimal. So we still need to understand how much of that is happening um, if we want to understand uh, economic activity, even if the implication is, okay, that's a source of, of um, reduced TFP that, we, that, that there's no direct um, policy implication for. Okay, um, natural and policy experiments. So increasingly people have looked at things like you know, relax, uh, changing capital requirements, increasing capital requirements on banks. You know, if you have great data, you can see that's binding on some firms and not on others. And so you can see what happens. You can use that to estimate dispersion. I should have this recent paper by um, Dave, Dave Donaldson and, and collaborators. And I think it's, yeah, I think it's Ecuador. Is that right? Um, anyway, that, that finds, um, that uses a natural experiment and finds very small differences in the marginal product of, I think it's labor across um, firms relative to the average product differences. So that's an example of using a, um, a natural experiment where there was increases in, in government contracts across some firms, but not others, to try to estimate these gaps and finding small gaps. So I have no stake, you know, I, I wanna know the answer, right? If the answer is measurement errors is responsible for a lot of this dispersion, that's really good to know because then it's not real misallocation. Um, if, the, if, if it's misspecification of production and elasticities, maybe we can find that in a, in a natural or policy experiment, find that the gaps in true values of marginal products aren't as big as the measured gaps in average products. As you know, we, we really need to know what's real versus what's, what's misspecification or mismeasurement in order to try to get at uh, policy improvements and it might actually make things better. Um, Natalie Bao and Adrian Matre have a really nice paper coming out in Econometrica about how FDI liberalization in India, which we'd kind of studied to death, uh, or not we, but I mean, I have one paper on it, but a lot of people have studied, they took a, a different angle on it, which is to say the firms, if, if this is a form of reducing a, a capital friction because the foreign firms come in and provide capital when they when they buy up a, a local enterprise, then um, then you should see the firms that, that respond the most are the ones with initially high average products of capital, and that's exactly what they find. So that's a really interesting example of how you know you couldn't see it by just looking at industry productivity. You might see an effect, but you might not know where it's coming from. They say it's it's in particular rapid capital expansion on for for. Um, firms or plants with initially high average products of capital. And then people have been looking at branch, uh, it, branch bank ex expansion into poor cities that were underbanked, had less um, banks per capita and an explicit government policy to open more branches. 
and use that variation across space to as, as a as a natural slash policy experiment to see what it does to things like firm entry and growth. And so I would just say that's a great opportunity to look at impacts on on efficiency and misallocation as well. Okay, let me pause, see if there's questions or comments at this point. So version of like, I'm not going on in class until someone asks a, asks a, <laughs> asks a question or answers a question. Um, I won't literally do that, but. Okay, feel free to interrupt though if, if something comes up. Um, Pete, uh, let me, yeah, since you, so uh, there, there's a question in, in the Q, written QA. There, there, are, there are several, we don't, time doesn't allow, unfortunately, every, but, um, but one that I think might, Intrigued people would be from Fang Ji Wang uh, asking, um, going back a bit, sorry, but you know, uh, give okay. the chance to pause. Could you please uh, maybe say a bit more or possibly give examples of um, environmental issues, environmental externalities and their relationship with misallocation? Um, that's really interesting. I mean, I think- I know you touched you know, on one, it, but if you could say a bit more, yeah. it might uh, be appreciated. Yeah. Um, I think that seems like an area, a promising area for people to start working on more. I know of only a few things. Um, one is, I think there's some work saying that that um, that uh, some of the quantitative easing by central banks in advanced economies may have affected big firms that are that are actually disproportionate polluters, um, and so may have. You know, to try to reduce misallocation of capital, they might have actually not only tilted the allocation of capital across big firms or small firms, but um, kind of worsened uh, environmental, well, gone in the opposite direction of internalizing the environmental externalities. So that's one example of something I've seen. Um, another example is done just looking in, in Chilean data uh, with Ernesto Pastin about to what extent there's differences in TFPR with, with carbon usage. So if you had a carbon tax with that, Amplify misallocation, or would it mitigate it? Would it would it um, would it help solve some of this misallocation, or would it um, or would it or, or or would it make it worse? Um, so I guess another way to say that would be that the um, that some of this some of the uh, the misallocation that we're finding could be um, could actually be efficient if some firm is, is producing too little, but it's a polluter. That would be the simplest way to say it. Imagine the firms with big markups are big polluters. Well, the markups are actually doing a little bit of good, and that maybe on that there we'd like to do them even more. If we had a carbon tax, maybe they'd shrink even more. So I think that's just a really interesting topic. Um, you know, there's local pollution and global pollution too. So I, so I'd like to see more on that. I guess that's consistent with my starting to look at it in the Chilean data. Um, so, but there might be more out there that I'm not aware of. Um, but I think that's that's really important because that's another way in which the this framework is limited, which is if you're just looking at these private returns, you're missing these social externalities, environmental, but but there's other other types as well. Knowledge externalities. You know, we, we naturally think the market's misallocating when it comes to pollution externalities that are negative or knowledge externalities that are positive. So we'd like the government to to, to tilt things and maybe amplify some of the TFPR dispersion there uh, in service of internalizing externalities. So yeah. Um, all right, so I guess this relates a little bit to, um, I'll say misallocation versus inequality first, to say where something that improved allocative efficiency might have worsened inequality. So, um, so you could either suffer the misallocation and as a way to reduce inequality, or you could reduce the misallocation and that's gonna make inequality worse. So um, I would view a lot of the trade literature as a version of saying, hey, trade liberalization, which is reducing misallocation, um, actually worsens inequality. So you can imagine countries choosing to, um, to endure some of the misallocation. I'm doing some work in progress saying, you know, hey, maybe the majority of the people would suffer given there's a big size wage premium. So there's rich workers and rich workers, there's high wage workers at, at high TFPR firms. If you subsidize them, not only would that have competition issues, which were mentioned earlier, but it would raise and, and maybe increase inequality among owners, which is emphasized by Boer and Midrigan, but might increase worker wage inequality as well. So you could have a majority of workers that, that lose from that, or at least less gain less. 
And Atkin, Faber, and Gonzalez Navarro is a good example of they found everybody gained, not everybody literally, but in, in you know different groups. Um, even you know, say the I'm not trying to remember if it's the bottom decile or the bottom quartile or what it was, but they, they even gained despite the fact that there's a lot of disruption of the informal sector um, as a result of <clears throat> the FDI. But the point is, you could also have things like policymakers say, I don't have an interest in allowing Walmart into India. It's going to wipe out all these all these small firms that um, have low wages and low consumption anyway, so it's just gonna worsen inequality. So it could lead from a political economy point of view to a coalition to block it. It could also be bad for a majority of people. So <clears throat> if you have a social welfare function that puts enough weight on them or even puts equal weight on them, it, it could actually reduce the gains from reducing this allocation because you're, you're worsening inequality and you might wanna pull back on. You might do re reduce misallocation less and in, as a way to, to mitigate inequality. I mean, <clears throat> that's just another version of what we do when we say we tax and transfer. We might think that causes distortions, but we're okay with that because it's achieving our objective of, of promoting social welfare by reducing inequality. Okay, so this is, I guess, a little bit environmental. There's issues with like this fascinating paper, to me at least, um, about water rights in India that suggested there's a lot of misallocation of water across firms, but that people also view it as fair, what's currently being done, so that if you allowed um, more efficient firms to access more water, you'd increase inequality and people people didn't want that to happen. Um, so that's a really interesting example of that. Okay, um, this is what I was referring to. Um, big plants pay much higher wages. If you think the size premium is big in the US, it's gotten a lot of study. It looks even more steep in, in places like India and Mexico. Okay, so I wanted to emphasize too that there, there are ways in which mi reducing misallocation can reduce inequality. So it's instead of misallocation versus inequality, like you either suffer misallocation or you suffer inequality. Here, your misallocation is is uh, is costing you equality. So um, Banerjee and DeFlo talk about a bunch of small and medium enterprises with high average products of capital. So they were below average in terms of the you know relative to the bigger firms. Um, so reallocating more capital to them with high returns. Um, this was more like a a policy experiment or uh, that was done there, or natural slash policy experiment. So maybe this is actually the, the, the wrong phrase. They're, they were trying to estimate the marginal product to cap value, marginal product to capital there. Then my study I did with, with Chang and Eric and Chad um, reduced wage inequality across <clears throat> by gender and race, we think. We think decline discrimination has reduced a, a major source of wage inequality. So that was one where reducing misallocation may have reduced um, inequality. So, in, so the, these misallocation not be it, uh, reducing it might not be at the expense of more inequality. It could actually reduce inequality. Um, so, it's Akshit and Baslan, Lanzi and Lottie's study of politically connected firms in in Italy um, that could that favors big firms. The politically connected ones make these fixed investments and in, in political ties, and so it arguably increases inequality that this crony capitalism exists. And so attacking crony capitalism might reduce inequality. Um, Bento has some nice papers looking at um, similar to what we're what what I did in this paper, but focusing on entrepreneurs in particular, either by gender or by by race in the U.S., and arguing that um, there's barriers. So so we mentioned this study in particular, uh, this recent study by Morazzoni and Sai, which is is fascinating because it. It, um, it, it touches on many things that we talked about. For one, it says, uh, it looks like the average product of capital is high among female entrepreneurs in the US. So it looks at newly started firms and looks at their return on capital. Now you could say things like, well, maybe it's the kind of industries they're in. So it survives controlling for industry. In particular, it fades with age. So if you thought it was just industry, then it shouldn't fade with the age of the firm. And the fading with age is consistent with they're able to save their way out of it. And the other thing they found that was fascinating was that you might have said, well, maybe they have higher default rates, higher risk. The default rates were lower. So it's like women were starved for capital, had less um, external capital. They relied, had to rely more on internal capital, had higher average products. They seemed to save their way out of it, and they'd pay their, the, the, the bank loans at a higher rate. So um, this is evidence, again, from the U.S., consistent with maybe reducing that might be discrimination. Um, it could just be financial frictions, though. But reducing it might re reduce inequality. Um, and then there's a paper by Spunklar and, and Goldberg that talks about how female entrepreneurs employ more women. 
So reducing barriers to female entrepreneurs could potentially reduce gender inequality in, in wages and employment. Um, and they get they get big effects of that. But that's a fascinating new angle that I hadn't seen before that that um, that women versus men entrepreneurs employ women women dis women entrepreneurs employ women disproportionately. So there might be distortions in who they hire as well as distortions in their access to entrepreneurship to begin with. So again, these are these are more hopeful because they're all ways in which reducing misallocation wouldn't wouldn't give us a further headache in terms of inequality, but instead could actually reduce inequality and promote equality. So a more but a nice optimistic um, area of potential research. Brian? Yeah, since this seems to be related with equality and inequality, I'm wondering if there is some scope or if there is work done with relationship to conflict, I mean political conflict. I wonder if reducing misallocation can reduce political conflict and probably if there is any relationship with other political economy outcome. So misallocation and conflict. I I don't have a great answer to that off the top of my head. I mean, I think and this reminds me of a of a paper I discussed years ago by uh Ditella, um, which is like, why isn't capitalism more popular in developing countries? And he was saying basically it's associated with crony capitalism. Like it could be associated with selling off monopoly rights to a foreign multinational. That's like neocolonialism. That doesn't sound great at all. Or or giving monopoly rights to politically connected local firms. So um I think misallocation to the extent that it's tied to crony capitalism could be a source of political conflict. You know, like you could, I don't want to say if it's a source or it's wrapped up within political conflict. Like if an insider group is seizing resources or trying to seize resources, you know, at the expense of another group or groups are battling for access to natural resources or other. So those, they could be wrapped up in each other. And I think I mentioned in the Indian example, how, I mean, you could also have you know, policies to reduce misallocation could be really unpopular and generate, you know, uh, you know, overthrowing of governments either democratically or or undemocratic. I mean, I guess you could even say in the United States, you know, um, the decline of 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 low skilled job opportunities or medium skilled job opportunities due to the deindustrialization, due to exposure to trade with China, probably not a, a leap to say that that has an impact on on um, U.S. trade policies and you know. Trump being elected and and maybe even you know um, rejecting um, democratic norms and and uh, respecting you know outcomes of elections. So that would be an example where probably not too much of a leap to say uh, policies that re that reduce misallocation but that increased inequality may have furthered political conflict. So I'd have to think about it a lot more. I think that's a really interesting thing to think about the interactions of those. I mean, anytime you see things like governments raising prices of subsidized products, say food uh, or necessities are subsidized and it reduces those subsidies and then there's riots, that's an example of political conflicts interacting with attempts to reduce misallocation. So I guess that's why one of the reasons why I think it's so interesting for us to try to find ways in which reducing misallocation can also reduce inequality rather than increase it. Um, there's potential for, oh, even then, right? Even, there's some policies that benefit the majority, but if the minority suffers, that, that might generate political conflict. Um, okay. So I have some stuff in here on, on firms and the data sets. I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip over that. Um, and uh, I wanna talk a little bit in my remaining um, six minutes or so about some of my favorite papers in the literature that I haven't touched on already, or maybe some of the ones I've touched on, I wanna say a little bit more about. Um, so one, I think, you know, I mentioned the measurement error as being a, a major issue. So there's a really nice paper by Julia Rottenberg and Kirk White that can see what cleaning is done in the U.S. census data. And their point is, look, there's tons of cleaning. And so one of the reasons that looks like dispersion in TFPR is small in the U.S. might be there's just a lot of cleaning done. And maybe less cleaning is done in other countries. And so it may be the cleaning process is making it look like there's more misallocation in India relative to the US than there really is. That's the, that's um, but I think this raises you know the issue of measurement, which is really important. You know, we don't want to mislabel mismeasurement true misallocation with policy implications. So I, I wanted to emphasize this study uh, up, up front. Um, so and I, I did some work that I already touched on that tried to get at mis 
mismanagement that's, that's suggested in the U.S. that it might be a growing problem over time. Um, so adjustment costs. I mentioned adjustment costs earlier. There's this Asker et al. paper that's quite nice that, that finds that in countries with basically bigger TFPQ shocks, but the same adjustment costs, they'll, they'll display more dispersion in the average products of capital. And they're saying, look, that's, that's not inefficient. That's constrained optimal. Uh, there's issues with the sample of this, but the, the David and Venke, when they looked at the sources of capital misallocation, are a nice update of this. And what they found was that they didn't just look at the dispersion in the average product of capital, um, but they looked at how persistent it was. And if you had a convex ad adjustment cost, you should see a lot of persistence to it. And they don't find uh, that much persistence to say, for example, investment rate differences. Investment rate differences, if you're slowly trying to you know, build a new capital, higher capital stock in response to a high, an improvement in your TFPQ, you should have a lot of serial correlation. When looking at this additional moment, investment persistence, they find a much smaller role for convex adjustment costs. And you might think non-convex adjustment costs, but then, the, then the, there should be a lot of volatility. So when they try to get at this in US and Chinese data, they, they find it's important, but it's responsible for something like a seventh of the dispersion in the average product of capital. So saying adjustment costs are an important source of this dispersion, but it's not the, the, the dominant source. Okay, so um, I already mentioned the, the Kerrigan Vincent paper, um, and this is a nice paper. I'd like to see them, it's been followed for a while. I'd love to see them follow up on it. They found the same thing. There's a lot of dispersion across plants, but they actually argue it's misallocation within firms and it's related to you know, principal agent problems and management quality. So that's, I think, just a really interesting potential area of research um, to, to, to go after. Um, I kind of touched on this already, but I wanted to revisit it, which is Haltwanger, Kulik, and Severson have a nice paper where they say, hey, I think things that are being labeled misallocation are really variable markups or non-constant returns to scale. Now, variable markups, that's misallocation. So it's it's endogenous misallocation as opposed to the, this, this these these wedges that these mysterious wedges tau that could be revenue taxes, um, but but that I would call misallocation um, returns to scale less than one. So I guess what I wanted to emphasize though about this study is that deviations from CES and CRS um, they can reduce misallocation for given wedges. So what I mean by that is that that um, CES and, and uh, monopolistic competition and constant returns to scale are not just, they're, they're not, there's nothing knife edge about that in the sense that you can relax any of those assumptions and you're still going to come back out some tows or some distortions that are endogenous with markups. You can back out distortions and you can back out TFPQ. Nothing's going to be uh, ultra sensitive to that. But um, the, the damage done by those distortions can be different under things like diminishing returns to scale or our, our variable markups. So for example, if a firm has high markups endogenously, as opposed to just being taxed a lot, um, then the elasticity of demand it faces is smaller, so that's gonna do less damage. So that's what, what um, work by Edmund Midgerkin and Zhu, for example, find that when they have uh, variable elasticity of demand systems, so you have endogenous markups that are bigger for bigger firms, that that doesn't do as much, the same markup doesn't do as much damage with basically a low sigma endogenously that it, than it would if the sigma was exogenously high and the, and the, and the tau was, was hitting them. So I think the details of exactly what the market structure is, the, the preferences are, and the production technology are, even to the extent that they don't get away, get, get rid completely of the wedges, they're going to affect how much damage the wedge does in terms of aggregate TFP. So that's one of the, I think, the enduring lessons of this paper. Um, Dinger and Morrow have a really nice paper where you know they're, where they drive home that market dispersion is generating misallocation, but they also look at how how um, how entry is distorted. And they don't find find big effects there. And Edmund Midgerkin and Chu do the same thing. They find um, this is they they find small amounts of um, misallocation from um, markups in the U.S. And interestingly, of that small amount, only a little bit comes from markup dispersion. They've got a particular uh, variable elasticity of substitution preferences that limits how much market dispersion you can get. So, for example, Bakke and Fari assumed arbitrary market dispersion, so they got a, a ton more. So this number might be might be too low potentially, but it's interesting that they point out you know the average market can distort. This is the, related to the double marginalization point that that um, 
Dave and David brought up, which is it can distort intermediates relative to labor, for example, and of course, things like labor supply. Um, so, but so far, these studies haven't found a big effect on, on entry, uh, you know, in these quantitative theory models. Um, Peters has a really nice paper, it react, interacting misallocation due to markups with growth incentives and also things like entry barriers. And there's a follow-up paper that, that Michael has with Connor Walsh. It's very nice. Um, that looks at also, again, kind of interacting um, endogenous markups with incentives to innovate and for both incumbent firms and entrants. So I think this is a growth area that I kind of touched on when I said that there's um, there's dynamic implications of misallocation, but this is these are explicit papers in the growth literature that are they're going at this. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm running out I'm running out of time I think so I'm going to stop now. I left more slides than I knew I could cover because I figured people might just be able to look at them and see some comments I have on some of these other papers in the literature. But I think I'll I think I'll stop now. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you so much, Pete. That was a wonderful lecture. And uh, we'd like to both thank Pete and hope everyone joins us next Thursday, our next lecture at uh, uh, 10 a.m., uh, where we'll be, uh, I think, talking about labor and, and, and capital, uh, uh, which are obviously an important part of this misallocation story. Yeah, the Chris's will we'll, we'll cover some of that, right? So um, thanks for this opportunity yeah, yeah. and also the unusual time that, that accommodates my, my time zone nicely. Thank you. <laughs> Well, we thank you. And thanks everyone for attending. See you Thursday. Thank you. Much.